Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar session from the GSMA, the AI for Impact team. So to begin, welcome everyone to the fourth installment in the GSMA's webinar series using mobile big data analytics to combat challenges, including COVID-19. These sessions were conceived as a means to support and share knowledge with supply side stakeholders, there being mobile network operators, but also demand side stakeholders, including governments and policymakers, and to help those generally uh, in this space to develop a foundation level of understanding and to help establish the provision or use of services in your location. My name is Rob Childs. I'm the Strategic Engagement Lead for the GSMA's AI for Impact initiative and will be hosting today's session for you. This edition will be focusing on the topic of sustainability and funding. And our aim for this session today is to share with you our learnings regarding sustainability and to highlight its relevance to enable development and adoption of new services powered by mobile big data analytics. I'm delighted, therefore, to have several experts in the field to join us today. Uh, the first is my colleague, Hilary Kemp, um, who is the Strategic Product Director for the AI for Impact initiative here at the GSMA. Hilary will first introduce us to the main concepts regarding sustainability and funding when developing new mobile big data analytics services and solutions. Hilary will then host for us a panel session, both to demonstrate the impact of mobile big data analytics solutions, but also to share the operational experiences regarding sustainability and preparedness. And I'm pleased to have three very knowledgeable panelists join us today to share their experiences with us. Uh, these are Dr. Richard Benjamins, who is the Chief AI and Data Strategist at Telefonica, Mohamed Chowdhury, who's partner in PwC in Australia, and last but not least, Manuel garcia Harans, who is the Chief Scientist at UNICEF. Um, to give you a little more information on our, on our, on our panelists today, um, Richard is among the 100 most influential people in data-driven business, featuring in the Data IQ 100 list, uh, the former Chief Data Officer at AXA, um, with 10 years experience at Telefonica in several, several management positions related to big data and analytics. Uh, Richard is also the co-founder of a startup and an NGO and a frequent speaker on data and AI events. Uh, he's also a member of the, B, uh, the Business to Government Data Sharing Expert Group of the European Commission and author of The Myth of the Algorithm. Um, Richard describes his passion as lying in creating value from data, uh, commercial value, but also value for society. Um, he's the founder of Telefonica's Big Data for Social Good Department and currently works to look at how to make data and AI sustainable from a business, societal and ethical perspective. Um, he's also a strategic advisor to Big ML, which is a startup to put machine learning in the hands of business people and to focus 360. Uh, Mohammed, who's joining us from PwC uh, in Australia, from Melbourne today, um, is a member of the firm's global telecom media and technology leadership team and has previously held senior roles at both Vodafone Group and IBM. Uh, his focus is on the intersection of technology, industry, and society on growth in and inclusion, uh, incl as well as new technologies such as 5G and IoT and industry reforms. Uh, having worked across 86 countries with telcos, governments, the World Bank, uh, GSMA, WEF, and the UN Broadband Commission, as I mentioned, Mohammed is joining us from Melbourne today. Um, he's passionate about inclusion and is also uh, in the process of delivering a book, uh, Border Cross Crossings, My Journey as a Western Muslim, which will be published in 2021. Uh, finally, uh, last but not least, is Dr. Manuel garcia Harans, who is the Chief Scientist at UNICEF's Office for Innovation and Information and Communication Technology Division, who have a joint initiative on big data and artificial intelligence. Um, having worked at UNICEF for more than six years to bridge the gap between data science and the needs of most vulnerable children. Uh, within UNICEF, he has co-created the Magic Box program to build research and partnerships that can transform big data and AI into equitable tools to better respond to epidemics, natural disasters, and to deliver results to the most vulnerable populations. Um, throughout the science team, UNICEF Innovation has also been focusing on the future of digital vulnerabilities, so working to identify and cure emerging computational inequalities such as uh, bias in new sources of data and unfairness in algorithms. And Manuel holds a PhD in computer science from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Finally, we will wrap up today's session with an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions. And we'll let you know where we can find, you can find additional information on the approaches we've covered in today's session. One final reminder, we invite you to submit questions for the Q&A, uh, which you can do using the button on the right-hand side. So let's begin. 
As every one of us is experiencing, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a tremendous impact on people all around the world, um, on public health, on the way we live, uh, on the way we work, and the way we learn. Uh, from the outset of the pandemic, the mobile industry has been stepping up to help people, businesses, governments, and vulnerable communities, not just ensuring connectivity and network stability, so managing the tremendous surge in traffic by investing in added capacity to keep people connected, but also helping governments to disseminate vital health and emergency information and advice, offering critical communications and telemedicine services to hospitals, providing tools and content to support homeworking and remote learning, or helping people experiencing financial hardship by providing flexible payment options, lifting broadband data caps to enable increased usage, free public Wi-Fi, and many more. In today's session, we continue our series of webinars focused on leveraging AI and big data analytics for COVID-19. For those of you new to this series, let me begin by briefly explaining the AI for Impact initiative. The GSMA launched uh, this initiative in 2017 with the aim to scale up mobile big data analytics for AI and the Sustainable Development Goals. We have an advisory panel of 12 UN agencies and global partners, including the World Health Organization, UNICEF and the World Bank, and a task force of 21 mobile operators from around the world. Together at a global level, we're establishing a common framework for implementing mobile big data projects. That is defining the technical, commercial and ecosystem needs, and critically, the privacy and ethical requirements to deliver sustainable products and services. At the local level, we work with operators, governments and partners to implement projects and cross-sector collaborations to unlock the market opportunities. To support the sharing of this common framework and knowledge, we've established this webinar series. Uh, today's is the fourth edition. If you weren't able to join us for previous uh, editions, I would encourage you to revisit these and recordings of those are available on the webinar link indicated on the slide. The first edition provided an overview of mobile big data analytics, explaining what we mean with mobile big data analytics and AI products and services. In short, that is that mobile operators are leveraging aggregated, non-identifiable mo non mobile network data and combining this with other third-party data sets applying advanced analytics and packaging this into meaningful tools that can ultimately aid government agencies in evaluating planning and decision making. We then moved into three deep dive editions looking at the foundational components based on the AI for Impact Initiatives experiences. The first being privacy and policy as safeguarding privacy and ethics is paramount. Uh, the GSMA has over the past years published privacy and ethical considerations for mobile big data analytics and AI such as transparency and accountability, inclusiveness and fairness, security and safety. Mobile operators broadly are committed to protecting the privacy and rights of individuals and will ensure that any assistance provided in response to the COVID-19 crisis is delivered in accordance with the applicable data privacy laws. The technical considerations for delivery and adoption as mobile big data and AI products and services require innovation and investment, um, operators are capturing billions of data points uh, from the operation of a vast, complex and dynamic mobile network. Continued investment and innovation in processing, advanced analytics and packaging of this data is required to ensure that the end product is useful and meaningful, particularly for services that are delivered on an ongoing basis and therefore require automated solutions. Um, these require sustainable business models, which are the focus of today's edition. Before launching into that, um, a few words on the value of mobile big data and AI in COVID-19 response. Um, mobile big data analytics is highly valuable to governments in their COVID-19 response to help understand to what extent, to the extent to which people are, and where people are moving um, or which communities are most vulnerable. Um, operators around the world have invested significant efforts and resource to provide governments unique products and services such as dashboards, and analytical insights to aid their COVID-19 response. Um, for example, in terms of lockdown evaluation in France, Orange worked with INSERM, which is the French public research agency for human health, um, quite early on in the epidemic to help prepare and evaluate lockdown measures. Not only did this analysis show a 65% reduction in journeys during lockdown, um, and how this was particularly effective in reducing work and recreational trips, it also showed unexpected results, for example, that 20% of the population um, appeared to leave Paris pre the lockdown announcement, 
Um, this illustrates both the care needed in the planning of public messaging, as well as the importance of up-to-date information for resource planning. Um, in terms of epidemiological modelling, uh, since January 2020, even before cases were detected in Norway, um, Telenor was working closely with the Norwegian government's COVID-19 task force to help model the potential spread of the virus um, in order to predict the number of hospitalizations, uh, the likely number of intensive care patients and deaths, so that the healthcare system could be better prepared and, and resources allocated where most needed. In terms of vulnerability assessment and managing supply chains, um, in Nigeria, MTN worked with the Nigeria Governors Forum to deliver a comprehensive dashboard to support the needs to support needs-based interventions by state. Uh, based on a likely number of cases and exposure, MTN estimated the number of vulnerable citizens who may require social support and identified the number of test kits, test centers, and medical practitioners required at the state level to more efficiently deploy aid and resources across the country. We mentioned briefly earlier replication at the local level, and GSMA is capturing learnings and replicating these in low and middle income countries with great thanks to the FCDO funding. For example, in the DRC, GSMA is facilitating collaboration across government operators and partners to create dashboards to help the COVID-19 task force evaluate the effectiveness of lockdown measures and monitor health, health infrastructure capacity for Kinshasa. Over the course of the last six months, we've seen more and more examples from around the world of mobile operators providing these solutions from Ecuador to Ghana, uh, from Italy to South Korea. Nevertheless, we're still um, away from uh, the widespread use of mobile big data analytics across a wide range of use cases at scale. And um, we're sitting on tremendous unused potential, not just currently, but also for future preparedness in crises and other important challenges that face governments, such as climate change, responding to national dis natural disasters or infrastructure planning, as well as others. Um, that's all I have in terms of introduction for today's session. So at this point, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Hilary Kemp. Um, Hilary, if you're ready, over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. Hello, my name is Hilary, uh, and I'm the Strategic Product Director in the GSMA's AI for Impact initiative. My background is in analysis, mathematical modeling, um, and product development, mainly within the telecommunications sector. Um, and this has allowed me to have first-hand experience of, of the big data that is generated by mobile networks and also the powerful insights that can be produced from it. It's also made me aware of the importance of understanding what is needed to turn insight into usable products that help customers achieve their goals, whilst also providing sufficient financial incentive for all involved to develop and deploy analytics-based products and services. So if we could move to the first slide. So the subject is sustainability and funding, um, and we have a great panel uh, who we're going to be speaking with shortly. I will just set the scene by explaining what is meant by sustainable products and services in the context of, of mobile big data and AI. Um, and I'll start off just with, with some, some definitions to make it clearer uh, what, what we're talking about when we talk about sustainability in this context. So first of all, a sustainable analytical product or service is one that's designed to be provided on a long term basis uh, and can also be scaled, for instance, uh, replicated across different parts of the world or adapted to address a range of different use cases. Another key component of a sustainable approach is an ongoing source of funding to invest. And that investment can go into skills, analytical tools and implementation of products and services. It's also investment into the future, into innovation, um, in order to harness the latest developments in analytics and AI, meaning that cutting edge analytical techniques and more effective products and services can be delivered. Which then leads to the third part of, of, of this definitions uh, slide, which is the sustainable business model, uh, which is a robust long-term source of funding that provides incentives and value for all parties involved which in turn encourages collaboration between private sector data generators and public sector and development agencies who are seeking smarter ways to create social and economic impact from their budget spend. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. This slide is intentionally very busy. I'm not planning to talk through the detail, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear, but I do want to give visibility of the range of activities that are being undertaken when we talk about 
funding uh, to support the creation of data insights and, and analytical products. Unlike a, a design survey or a census where information is already organized into a series of structured questions and answers, analysis of big data starts with a series of steps that extract and prepare a quality assured, relevant, privacy protected data set from the large repository of unstructured data that's collected by the minute uh, on every mobile network. This is shown in the, the processing step in, in this particular diagram. Um, the analysis stage often brings in other data sets uh, from outside of the, the, the mobile network space and makes use of sophisticated tools and techniques to identify patterns, trends and relationships. This is then packaged um, as a product or a service in the format best suited to the customer's requirements and the actions that they intend to take with this new insight. The previous webinar uh, in this series explored the technical work in detail. Uh, so I've only really included these, these, these elements here to illustrate why there's a need for, for funding this work. Firstly, funding is required for the expert resource, the process, analyze and transform data into a relevant form of product for the customer. Secondly, ongoing investment is needed in high capacity data storage, cloud capacity, powerful analytical tools and techniques. And thirdly, funding is required for the product definition, development and support so that a mobile operator delivers the right output in the right format at the right frequency for the customer. Now, the funding that we're talking about here can take a number of different forms. Um, one example is uh, a grant uh, that, that's provided by some form of donor, uh, which can act as a catalyst to develop new ways of working, harness unfamiliar sources of data, and develop digital skills, um, say, within a government. This funding helps it implement change and manage risk while building trust in, in new analytical products. And it also helps to establish some of the value that can be delivered uh, by, by exploiting this, this new information. But a type of funding um, uh, uh, that, that's, that's of the nature of a grant is often time limited. So other long term business models need to be found to continue the creation and supply of, of products of this nature. There are examples of sustainable business models in place for some of the analytics products and services already supplied by mobile operators. These include subscription models for access to regular feeds of insights and, and analytics platform products, or more project-based uh, business models where analytical, analytical products and services are delivered in response to a request to tender, say, for a specific piece of work. Um, for instance, say a strategic infrastructure plan. Whatever form the business model takes, it will only be successfully established if all parties involved feel there is enough incentive for them to commit their expertise and effort to it. For a mobile operator, this means seeing some return on the large investments that have been made to create robust, privacy protecting data analytics products and on the ongoing investment they make in the expertise uh, of their data scientists and, and analysts. And for a demand side agency, such as a government, it means being able to measure the value of using these data products. Um, and this could include benefits such as the speed of delivery of new insight in a rapidly changing situation, um, in, which enables faster response and better social and, and financial impacts often as well. Or the benefit could come from the geographical granularity of the information, allowing plans to be fine tuned at a local level um, and, and costs optimized. Or value may come from the ability to view the historical data, as well as the current patterns of, of population movement, and therefore quickly gauge emerging trends and unusual behavior, which could result in more robust plans and better investment decisions in the future. Should we move on to the next slide, please? So let's have a look at why sustainability is beneficial um, and the wide range of use cases that mobile analytics and insights can be applied to. Sustainability is a goal that's shared by um, all parties involved in planning effective programs with social and economic development objectives. Governments, um, humanitarian agencies uh, and, and donors are interested in long-term sustainability of the initiatives that they invest in 
because these problems, these programs often take many years to deliver substantial change and benefit to society. In fact, the United Nations SDGs contain the word sustainable in the title, uh, so that the approach to achieving these goals is one that aims for long term ongoing benefit. This webinar slide shows a framework that was created by one of today's panelists, Mohammed Chowdhury from PwC, which takes the UN SDGs and maps them to five themes uh, with a number of example use cases underneath each theme. Each of these represent examples of how mobile data analytics could be used to inform decision making and planning and have a positive impact on society. So it's a very quick kind of tour through the, the, the types of benefit and impact that can be created. Let me pick out a few. So some benefits uh, can be financial. Um, if you look at the yellow column in particular, um, an example here is using mobile data to give an up, up to date view of where people spend uh, time during each day, week and month. Um, and by knowing uh, a lot about those patterns, it can result in more effective investment decisions about in where infrastructure should be located to reach the maximum number of people. Some benefits are in environmental, um, so the green column. For example, knowing mobility patterns of people allows city transport to be better planned and managed and negative side effects such as air pollution tackled. And some benefits are in terms of quality of life or, or even in some cases lives themselves, uh, which is more reflected by the last three columns, the orange, blue and the, the pink. Um, examples include rapidly responding to natural disasters or very topically to disease outbreaks, where timely, robust data is very valuable as speed is of the essence. Which, is, which brings us to the intense interest in mobile network data and mobility analysis that has been shown this year in 2020, driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. During the first phase of the emergency response, dynamic data about movement patterns uh, was provided to governments and health experts in, by many mobile operators in many countries. Mobile operators responded to this unprecedented situation like many other industries did by diverting expertise, effort and analysis to help tackle the disease. But as the pandemic looks to be with us for many months to come um, and the economic impact possibly for many years, there is a need to find a more sustainable way of working. As governments review and reshape their plans to go digital with the recent experience of the pandemic in mind, Data analytics is an area that, that, that really does deserve to be considered as part of that strategy for the future. As this diagram of use cases shows, mobility data can, con can uh, continue to provide important insights about the changing movement patterns and behaviours of, of populations. Huge changes in mobility have been seen in some countries this year already, and some of these changes may well be permanent. For example, the reduction in commuting due to increased working from home, or changes in where and when people shop. Therefore, mobility data from phone networks can be an important source of insight feeding the future plans for the post-COVID economies, cities, and of course, healthcare systems in, in many countries. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll end this introduction uh, by summing up some of the benefits of sustainable solutions supported by sustainable source of funding. I'm having trouble with that word, which is a bit of a problem for this, <laughs> for this webinar. Um, first of all, they can achieve scale, so delivering more benefit for more people across more geographies. Sustainable um, sources of funding also encourage explore, exploration of new use cases and new business models. Um, they, they allow a certain amount of, of um, confidence that there is uh, the ability to explore um, and experiment um, and look at ways to improve um, and to expand uh, what's, what, what's happening. There's a sort of a, a certainty of, of, of being able to proceed with the work. Because they attract long term investment, um, sustainable solutions uh, create incentives to improve and innovate using new techniques, for instance, um, AI. Sustainable solutions also support long term initiatives, long term change initiatives, helping transform ways of working. And finally, a sustainable approach delivers a larger impact and value over time because of all of these, these effects adding together um, and ensuring that uh, more benefit can be can be leveraged from the work.
Okay, so if we could move to the next slide. Uh, we're now going to bring some of these themes to life um, by uh, bringing our panelists in. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce you, uh, first of all, to Richard Benjamin, uh, the Chief AI and Data Strategist from Telefonica. Uh, Richard, please could you say a few words about your role, introduce the mobile an analytics activities you've been involved in, um, uh, and highlighting some of the role that sustainability plays in the way that you, you work. Uh, yes, that that is uh, uh, that is fine. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, can can I get my slides? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. So uh, my name is Richard Bayman. Uh, I'm I'm quite a long time in the field of using big data for social good. I founded Telefonica's department uh, in this matter uh, in 2016. But Telefonica has been working in the field in research for many years before. The objective was to bring all those uh, social good projects to the market and, and really innovate, innovate on the ground. Uh, we've done uh, in the past few years many uh, projects, as you can see here, in different areas uh, related to the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, across our footprint, which is in Europe, uh, and also in uh, south, uh, Southern and, and Central America, we worked on uh, natural disaster response, we collaborated with uh, Manuel, who is also here from UNICEF, worked with uh, uh, on poverty um, and development metrics uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank and also the Spanish government. Uh, we worked on air quality in urban areas uh, in, in Brazil and in Spain, in large cities. Um, we work on climate change and the impact it has on, on people and, and, and their livelihood, like forced migration that was in, 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 in Venezuela, Colombia. And of course, we also worked on, now on the epidemics. Yeah, We worked in the past on Zika, uh, spreading of measles and swine flu. And uh, today we're working a lot on uh, COVID as well. Next slide, please. So here you can see a very brief overview of the countries that uh, we are active in, in collaboration uh, with uh, governments or final collaboration with governments for COVID. Um, I think that uh, Hillary tell, told us some of the use cases, Rob as well, and, and I think Manuel will give some of them more. I would like to focus a bit on how do you collaborate collaborate with the different, uh, with the governments, because in the end the government takes decisions and you have to reach them to some extent yeah well actually there is no one recipe uh, we have many yeah? so in spain we work through the statistics office uh, we also work with the research organization and we work with the european commission yeah? uh, in germany we work through the national health institute in the uk through uh, cambridge university in brazil through a telecom industry body uh, of the country um, in Argentina uh, through a university, in Ecuador through directly with the government and the National Emergency Center, and Chile and Colombia as well through universities. So there are very different ways of reaching uh, uh, government so that they can use those insights for decision making. Next slide, please. Uh, there are many challenges, however, to scale this up. Yeah? Most of the, the, the projects on the first slide are uh, were pilots. They are not running operationally for the reasons that Hillary mentioned. But even for those projects uh, that we've seen now with COVID, there is still a confusion in privacy. Uh, politicians and press uh, is confusing contact tracing with anonymized uh, and aggregated big data. There is an ethical question. Uh, is it ethical to use this technology? But actually I would turn it around. Is it ethical not to use this technology? Then there is this lack of financial, uh, financially sustainable uh, models. We will discuss this in the panel. And finally, sometimes there are political decisions, dimensions uh, to manage how COVID is managed in a country. And uh, sometimes you see yourself caught up in, in those things. And as a company, of course, you don't want to do that. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'd like to now uh, introduce Mohammed, Mohammed Chowdhury, uh, who's a partner at w PwC Australia. Um, and uh, Mohammed, I'd like to invite you as well to uh, say a few words about uh, your your uh, involvement in this space, your interest in, in mobile big data and AI, 
and also the way that uh, you've been involved in uh, looking at how analytics can be used to create uh, impact. Thank you very much, Hilary, and uh, good day to everybody. Um, the, uh, what I'd like to start with is um, really just going back to the problem statement, if you, if you like. And the problem statement, I think, here is that um, governments all over the world um, struggle to um, find the most effective and precise ways to respond to all sorts of policy challenges, be it to do with um, addressing natural disasters, planning where to um, position medical and health facilities, or indeed how to deal with the challenges around pollution or environmental and climate change. Um, and what's became really evident from the development of the mobile industry over the last few years is that mobile and particularly mobile big data actually provides a number of reasons why um, the data that can be pulled from mobile networks can actually really help address some of those challenges in a much more specific and precise way. And that's because mobile networks have got great coverage, as you know, but they've also got authenticity in terms of the data that's collected, because the data that's collected can be very real time, can be very precise, um, and, and is not usually distorted. Um, it can be very timely. Um, it is very consistent, because mobile networks all over the world tend to operate in rather consistent ways. And the data that's produced from mobile networks can be e easily digitized, which means that they can be combined with other data sets. And the moment you start doing that, as Richard and Hillary have explained, um, you can really start creating what we call mobile big data types of solutions that lead to AI for impact. And the work that we did with the GSMA and the UN Sustainable Development Goals last year um, really addressed those challenges. So the challenge for governments to be more precise and specific in impact and the ways in which mobile big data can be harnessed. And what we found was, as you can see on this page, is that even if you take a relatively conservative view, you can actually come to the view that a very significant number of people could be positively impacted in their livelihoods through the scaled application of mobile big data solutions. And what we found looking across the five areas that Hillary outlined, um, is that even if you were conservative, you would expect to impact at least 3% of the world's population positively through one or other area through mobile big data. Um, and that would be by 2025, so relatively soon. That adds up to 150 million or more people around the world. And some of the examples of how that can be done are, are on the sort of right-hand side of that page there. I'm just going to pick one or two to try and really bring this to life. If you have a look at the second one that's there, if you're able to read that, that's the example of um, how many people could potentially be impacted positively through the better specificity um, in the location of um, access to medical and healthcare services. So when we looked at this topic, we found that there are basically 40 countries around the world where people have got significant disadvantage in accessing healthcare today. Um, and across that 40 country, the number of people who are negatively impacted in accessing healthcare is about 1.5 billion population. A large number of those people are in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America. Now, if you were to take mobile big data, and you were to combine the data insights that you can get from the movements and location of people at a group level, and combine that with the data that comes with respect to the government's planning of deployment of where to put healthcare facilities, what we found is that you could improve by 4%, pretty conservatively, um, the access levels of people to healthcare. Now, a 4% improvement on 1.5 billion people adds up to 60 million people, which is a huge number. But if you think about it, it's actually based on a relatively conservative assumption. We looked at that in the, in the, in the context of Malawi as one country, and we found that just in Malawi itself, um, there's a really, there's a really um, available opportunity right now 
around um, improving the location of some 900 health facilities. And the reason why it's very relevant to a country like that is because the country um, is in that um, Southern Africa region where there is quite a lot of migrating populations. Um, and there is really a benefit, if you like, from mobile big data being able to help governments plan. And the great thing, of course, is that the Malawi government, like many, uh, have got limited resources. So if they're able to be much more specific, um, they're able to have much more impact. And indeed, that's the case that we found across all five of the um, areas that we grouped the 17 SDGs into. Now, the classic thing now, and, and this links to what Richard was talking about, is how do we go from uh, great examples of the implementation of a use case to actually scaling that so that it's something that's much more widespread in terms of how it's adopted and how it's believed in? And so we did some work with the GSMA last year to really start to create what we call an impact framework for mapping, if you like, the 17 SDGs to different ways in which mobile big data interventions could have an impact. And we built an initial impact framework that can be applied to scale up. And I think the next sort of challenges, if you like, are really getting Government agencies, multilateral agencies, um, NGOs, and of course, mobile operators to begin really believe how it is that they can collaborate in order to um, scale up those sorts of impacts. Um, there couldn't be a better time for doing this because we're in a pandemic situation at the moment. And of course, in the last 12 months, we've also had major natural disasters such as the bushfires that we've had in, in my country in Australia. There are many reasons why this is actually um, no better a time than to be scaling it up, scaling it up now. The last point I'll make, which is linked to sustainability and funding, which is the theme of this webinar, is that in a funny sort of way, mobile big data and AI for impact offers governments an opportunity to be much more smart in terms of how they fund their policy programs for social impact. Because if you think about it, if you can apply the benefits of mobile big data, you're likely to help the government save billions of dollars in policy planning and expenditure because they're going to be able to have much more precise impact from their expenditure. So I think I'll probably just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And um, I will now introduce my third panelist. Um, uh, Manuel Garcia Herranz, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, uh, who's the chief scientist at UNICEF. Um, and Manuel, could you please uh, introduce again sort of the, the basics of your role, but particularly the recent experiences you've had when applying mobile analytics to address uh, some of the disease development challenges? Hi, Hilary, and, and thank you very much. And good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, so, yes, my name is Manuel Garcia and I've been working over the last six years at UNICEF trying to uh, bring the value and build capacity over using big data, data science, and, and AI. And there are three main uh, components in there. The first one is acknowledging that um, we can't do that alone, and that means uh, working with partners in private sector and, and academia. Um, Telefonica is one of our, our partners in, in Magic Box, actually. Um, and in order to do basically two things, one is exploring the potentials of these technologies, but uh, the second one is actually to try to cure the issues of, of bias and, and algorithmic inequalities that uh, come out from uh, the most vulnerable populations not having access to these technologies. Um, in that sense, one of the main areas of applications that uh, are very relevant today is on epidemics. And we know that epidemics move uh, with people, basically. So uh, we also know that we live in a connected world and we're seeing this firsthand over this year. Um, in that sense, we've started working with Ebola. Uh, we started with Zika, and this year, uh, when COVID started, um, uh, it's been uh, quite uh, quite a very specific example of that. So in this case, for example, this is um, a map of uh, how people travel over the world, uh, passengers, basically. Uh, this is thanks to a partnership that we set up with Amadeus back in Zika times. But over this crisis, uh, at the beginning, when uh, uh, when the cases began appearing in, in Wuhan and China, 
uh, it allowed us to begin answering some questions. So, for example, when TAM importation cases were appearing in some countries in Europe, uh, one of the quick questions was, why are we not seeing cases in Africa? Is that because the disease has not reached Africa, um, or is it because the health systems in there are not uh, uh, fine-tuned enough to detect that? So, based on that, we can conduct very quick analysis and say, well, uh, it looks like the number of passengers arriving to um, um, African countries from uh, COVID-affected uh, places uh, looks like this compared to the countries that uh, have already detected importations. And one thing that is very important to know in these emergencies is that the window for useful insights is sometimes very, very short. So this was actually insights that go up the chain, they get integrated with many other local insights, and then decisions are made, and suddenly the situation changes. And we see that um, as COVID becomes a pandemic, uh, there is no vaccine for them. Governments begin to take actions in order to try to cure that, uh, that uh, potential local spread of the epidemic. And in this case, we've been seeing all around the world all, all those measures of, of lockdowns, of uh, ban traveling, um, uh, school closures, um, all those things that actually are meant to reduce people mobility. So to, in order to slow the, um, uh, the spread of the disease. Now, in epidemics, we've been working with mobility a lot in the past. We know it's a driver for, uh, for the epidemic spread. Uh, but in this case, it was actually a new type of mobility. Uh, it's about how much the mobility is being reduced. So this is actually uh, a metric of the stringency of the policies that a particular country has put in place. And we can see how um, uh, when the health emergency is declared, most countries just spike up on the stringency of the policies. Quick question is, are those policies having an impact? And that's where this type of big data comes into place and allows us to actually monitor um, how, for example, the travel average travel distance per day drops down or not or how it slowly recovers uh, over time so uh, answering questions of, around the um, uh, sustainability over time for example or impact but in that case it was very important for us to understand is this uh, type of policies applicable to everybody is this affecting everybody the same and averages can be deceiving so you can have a drop in mobility of 48 percent 50 percent but when you begin disaggregating that but socioeconomic levels, you can see um, that actually is the richest part of the country that are being able to reduce their mobility much more than the poorest counterparts. And in that sense, very uh, relevant for emergencies is uh, can we trust all that we knew before? We've seen in some countries that actually um, the local context has changed a lot before the emergencies. It was actually the richest part of the population, the ones that traveled more per day. They did more. Uh, kilometers because they had more means, they had uh, jobs that are farther from home. But after these policies are put in place, actually the local context has changed and now it's the poorest populations, the ones that are traveling more distance per day. So that means um, uh, they have less means to uh, protect themselves and they're actually more exposed at the, at the moment. Um, also, this type of data allows us to have kind of a, a global view as a uh, which I was mentioning also with the real-time component, it can help us look back and learn from what has happened, which is going to be very, very relevant in the case of COVID, where we're seeing some countries going through a second wave and having this uh, type of insights uh, can allow us to uh, look and learn from what has been happening. Uh, this is just one example. There is so much more to do in the case of COVID, and this is just one layer of uh, more real-time information. Um, but the, one of the key areas we're looking into is, is in the socioeconomic impacts, which they're all related somehow to these uh, lockdowns and closing of schools. What will be the impacts on education, on poverty, on, on HIV on no, or non-COVID vaccinations, um, mental health, gender inequality. So um, it's been very important to have that kind of real-time layer that allows us to understand a little bit more of the, of the complexity and the complex relationships um, between uh, actions, uh, and reactions, right? So I'll, I'll leave it there uh, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. That's a fascinating series of insights there, and also from relatively simple graphs, how much information can be conveyed uh, about this, this very radical change that we've seen happening in most parts of the world, some, some to a lesser extent than others, uh, as a response uh, to the, the COVID pandemic.
Um, and on that topic, um, I'd like to start uh, asking a few questions to, to the other panellists, um, in particular Richard, first of all. Wh what have you learned from the COVID-19 experience and the spotlight that it's, it's put onto uh, this data that's available from uh, mobile networks and the very rapid changes in mobility we've seen in many places? Yeah, thanks, Hilary. Okay, so there are three uh, main things that I would like to highlight now that, that I have learned. Uh, of course, there are many more, but the, the, the three ones I want to share now is the first one is that uh, governments in general were not so well prepared to deal with uh, big data for this uh, purpose. So uh, you yeah, really had to convince them and explain them and what it meant. And even uh, when they understood it, it was very hard for them to put it into practice or not to not to put the technology into practice, but to consume this information and uh, and, and do something uh, with it. Yeah, so I think that's one of the learning uh, that we have to work on. Yeah? Train uh, governments that they can work with this kind of data in a rapid way. Yeah? Um, one of the things that I asked several times to to the governmental people we worked with is uh, suppose we give you this kind of insight that can help you predict something or take some action. Do you know how it will go uh, to the place where the decision is taken? And almost never we got uh, a positive answer on that. Yeah, It means that the, the, the route to action for this kinds of uh, new uh, data is not uh, business as usual in, in government. Yeah? So it needs a lot of champions and uh, initial individual initiative to, to make it happen. Of course it happens, but what I've seen is that it's far from uh, business as usual. The second thing uh, is actually a matter of education, yeah, of press, uh, even politicians in the large uh, society, uh, that there is a lot of confusion between uh, anonymized aggregated big data and uh, contact tracing, yeah? Uh, there's are completely different things. One is very individual to find out what people are also uh, maybe uh, uh, infected and uh, mobility anonymized uh, aggregated it has nothing to do with individuals. It's all about large groups uh, and movements of populations. Uh, but even so, uh, the press is mixing up the terms in the headlines, uh, which generates a lot of confusion in society. Uh, and what I've seen that's related to the third point, even politicians, yeah, uh, they get mixed up and they ask uh, questions. And even they can make statements that they are against those kinds of initiatives. Yeah? Uh, what I've seen here is that they're against uh, using uh, anonymized and big data for, for the use cases, for instance, that Manuel explained us, because they say uh, it is privacy a problem, the customers have not been asked, uh, it's like contact tracing. So if you as a company, uh, I mean, you can even get caught up yeah, in political debates that you definitely don't want to uh, be uh, be involved in. And so those are the three things that, that I have learned. Uh, some of them I, I suspected, um, but I've seen them now really yeah, that they have an impact in if you want to scale this kind of initiatives uh, up. Yes, really, really interesting observations, um, and I'm sure that there, there are probably many who've also experienced similar challenges um, uh, working across a number of different different parts of the world. Um, Mohammed, from a person who's one step removed from the hands-on um, uh, response uh, using the analytical information from from networks. What what do you see um, has been the implications of uh, this year's COVID-19 activity on um, using analysis and AI for, for, for impact in, in the future? Thank you, Hilary. I, I think it's um, really emphasized the potential role that um, mobile networks can play in this space. Um, I agree that um, the awareness or perhaps understanding of of how that role can can play um, is still being developed, if you like, amongst um, important decision makers. But I think what decision makers really want today in most countries faced with the COVID crisis is they want solutions that can move quickly and, and that can be implemented 
um, are ready to be implemented now. They're not interested in solutions that may take several years to build. And they're also interested in doing things which are going to be cost effective. And I, and I think the capability that the mobile industry has um, combining its data with other data sources is actually ready to be deployed right now because we already have um, billions of people um, using mobile networks and we have mobile networks covering um, significant proportions of the human population uh, on, on the earth. Um, not only that, but mobile operators are already extremely skilled in um, analyzing data collected from their networks, in making patterns from them, and in being able to use them for predictability of movement and behavior going forwards. And the applicability of that to the needs for managing responses to the COVID pandemic um, are very, very clear. The second thing I'd say is the entry cost is very low because mobile networks are already built and they're already operating. Um, these capabilities to build this sort of response mechanism um, doesn't require a lot more capital expenditure. It's ready to go um, and the marginal cost of using them is relatively low compared to other op options or alternatives. So I really think, Hillary, that um, that's why I was saying that I don't think there's a better time than now for AI for impact to really scale. I think we've got this sort of single but potentially, you know, quite quite big um, hurdle to cross, which is really getting stakeholders to see the impact. And I think as soon as they start seeing the impact and believing in it, I think the scaling will probably happen quite quickly. So maybe it just needs us to um, create a small number of very visible ways in which this is understood. And then I, I have a feeling that we might actually see change very quickly. One thing we have seen in the COVID is that human behavior can change very, very rapidly. So if we look at our behavior in terms of how many of us are now working from different locations or spending time on video or using broadband differently to what we did before or e-commerce, our behaviors have changed overnight. So there's no reason why we shouldn't actually think that we could still scale this very quickly in the, in the uh, opportunity that the current crisis presents. Thank you, Mohammed. Yes, some, some very interesting points there. Um, Matt Momar, can I bring you in um, and leverage your knowledge of uh, what we often call a demand side? Uh, so that's, that's the combination of the humanitarian development agencies and governments and ask what, in your opinion, is the most important change that needs to happen for these analytical technologies and, and data to become a common tool um, used in, in, in that development ecosystem? Hi, Karen. Um, yes. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the most important questions. I think uh, um, both Rich and Mohammed made two very important points on, on governments or humanitarian development organizations not being well prepared uh, as one of the main bottlenecks. And Mohammed was mentioning uh, um, th that demand for solutions for right now. Um, so in that sense, probably one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing that work best is actually to have capacity already established. Um, when answers are needed, if at that time we start to think about, let's do a project, uh, let's put up a team, let's look for partners, we're going to get laid always. And that, that means that solutions are never picked up. Um, the examples I, I was showing before, uh, actually the data, the data access and the data partnership with Amadeus was established during the Zika uh, epidemic. Uh, just a spoiler alert, we got laid uh, to get uh, relevant insights on, on Zika by the time we got data for Brazil. Um, which is where it started. Zika had become a Latin American problem and then an American problem uh, and then a world problem and data always came later. Now that partnership was held in time and Amadeus decided we, we want to be part of that. Uh, let's keep the channels open. And that has meant um, during COVID that we were able to put some uh, answers to questions right in the decision, in the decision makers pipeline in time. And that creates a lot of impact. So how can we make this, um, how can we train governments and agencies to be aware of the potentials of these technologies and, and use them um, is by actually 
putting them in front of, of these technologies as a useful tool. And the only way is to be prepared, to be to have all these systems ready by the time they're going to um, come with questions. So I would say that establishing that joint capacity, the, the technical teams that Telefonica has had, uh, along with the data partnerships that are already kind of set up so it's easy to turn them on, are are critical to um, to actually move these from pilots to, to being a useful resource, in my opinion. Thank you, Manuel. Um, I'm just, just looking at the fact that we've got a few um, uh, questions that have been posed. Um, and Rob, I don't know whether you've been looking at the, uh, the, the, the questions that have come in through the Q&A and could pick out uh, one or two if we've got time to sneak it in. Um, Sure, absolutely. Um, so I have um, going to the bottom of the list. Um, there are a couple of related questions. Um, so uh, one asking, uh, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about some of the outcomes of the collaborative efforts um, that have been taking place. Um, and, and I think linked to that is uh, potentially also an, slightly addressed in one of the, the comments just a moment ago in terms of um, is it a lack of government capacity, for example, staff to stay on top of the speed of change and the, and the use of big data to inform, design and develop um, agile policies to affect change? Um, Richard, perhaps you could you could comment on that a little bit because you, you mentioned uh, a number of collaborative efforts that Telefonica are involved in. Maybe share with us a little bit more about yeah. your experiences with those and outcomes or, or otherwise from those. Yeah, I think it's a, a mix of everything. Yeah, it's about uh, let's say digital maturity or data maturity of governments. Uh, I mean, companies went through that process, are still going through that. Governments are, are a bit later, but it will happen. Um, what, what I also think is what we, what we learned is that if you want to move those uh, those projects beyond pilots, then you need to get a final customer in the loop uh, in the discussion from the beginning with a certain commitment that if this works that they take a kind of commitment to put it into production yeah and that that requires funding but we've seen a lot uh, if you go with those projects to governments and i haven't seen a lot of exceptions there that they think it is some kind of philanthropic uh, action and they expect it completely for free yeah and if you say yeah but it has to run then say so sorry we don't have any funding uh, on the other hand, if you look at it, if you uh, um, so governments uh, spend uh, billions on, uh, for, let's say COVID, yeah. So we do this project with the Euro Commission. The European Commission says, sorry, we have no funding for you. You have to do it pro bono. We already do it for six months, and we are expected to do it for a, more than a year longer. On the other hand, the European Commission spends uh, 750 billion yeah, on COVID-related uh, problems. So it's that if you apply this kind of technology, you can actually save a lot of money on the operational side. And I think that's something that both governments and, and uh, sorry, Manuel, but also uh, uh, humanitarian organizations are not always aware of that, that you have to make the connection between this kind of technology and actually operating on the ground. Uh, and there you have a win-win for everybody. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm just just juggling um, some some different uh, questions here. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll ask one, which I, I'd like to to hear uh, responses from all three of you um, uh, on, if I can pose it. Uh, so, what are the, some of the funding challenges that you see? Um, is money available to, to to do more work in this space? Um, and particularly to do it in more than just a reactive mode, uh, which has been uh, the experience with, with, with the COVID situation in the earlier part of the pandemic. Um, and again, perhaps I'll go, go to, to Manuel to, to ask that, that question first. What are some of the funding challenges that you see? I, yes, well, I'm two, um, there, are many, there are many funding challenges. and. And some of those things are related to what Richard has just said, which I agree only to a certain extent. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna flag two main challenges that I see. Uh, the first one is that in all this loop of a, a, the for good uh, philanthropy um, and sustainable business, 
data capacity is normally decoupled from the funding. So if you if you look at private sector partners, you will see um, that the philanthropic events or the philanthropic arms of, of companies is normally decoupled from the actual technical expertise that has the data. So that uh, that funding is not available to um, to push these solutions. If you look into the humanitarian development side, you find the same thing. More, most of the philanthropic and, and the uh, financial sources for humanitarian development agencies, they are funding directly programs on the ground, nutrition, um, uh, vaccination, etc. They don't look that much into that sort of AI uh, data. So in both sides of the partnership, um, the funding is decoupled from that technical capacity. And when you go to actually funds for this uh, type of efforts, funding normally goes to specific applications. Uh, you know, cholera in this country or migration in this particular border uh, is very rarely focused on building joint capacity. And that's where I disagree a little bit with uh, Richard. Um, it is true that there is a lot of uh, uh, funding going on in humanitarian development, but that's because it costs a lot. When we're thinking about the figures on COVID, um, you need to look into the economic impact that COVID is going to have to see that that's really um, not that big of a funding, that actually the most immediate and pressing needs are, are not totally covered. So trying to push that uh, that boundary forward and saying, well, you need to invest in these AI and big data technologies because they're going to make you more efficient and they're going to save you money. I think for that, we need to actually prove that um, uh, it's going to make us more efficient. And one of the big challenges that we have in there um, in this space is uh, representativity. Um, there is a lot of uh, systems already in place. They are very good, actually, at, at counting the most vulnerable um, from social protection services, from uh, health services, and these technologies offer a very fast and, and uh, I would say, economic route um, in order to get insights. But one of the barriers that we need to break uh, is to show them this is this data is as good as yours or um, it actually covers these type of gaps. And there is no foundational funding either on the private sector side or the humanitarian side to actually build that uh, that joint capacity. So I'm going to I'm going to put it there, the decoupling of humanitarian and technology in terms of funding and how most of the funds go to very specific applications or projects, this six month thing on on one particular disease, one particular country, rather than saying, well, let's let's fund a joint capacity on both ends, build that uh, foundation layer. And on top of that, uh, things will come. Thank you. That's 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 quite a yeah significant um, insight that you've given there around the, uh, the 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 challenges with the way that work is is, is funded at the moment. Um, uh, Mohammed, do you have any any other comments or, um, on the visibility that you have uh, on the way that uh, this kind of work is funded or could be funded? Yeah, I've got uh, two two observations. Uh, one would be, I think it's um, it's in the realm of the mobile industry to uh, work through and create really solid proof points. Um, I think we've got very very good use case examples, uh, many of which we've talked about on today's call. Um, but I think that what we really need is um, for a very credible, scalable proof point to come out, one that one that the government that's involved um, really believes in. So I think that's something which the mobile industry has the opportunity to, to do. My second observation would be that I think actually in, in many countries, and, and often it's the most developing countries which um, are doing this, is that many countries are actually using um, mobile infrastructure very effectively already, and, and partly it's the developing countries that are doing that the most because they don't have much of an alternative. Um, so I, I know Bangladesh very well. I'm, I'm on the board of a of a digital technology company in Bangladesh, and I know, for example, in that country, the NGOs, the agencies, and the governments actually use um, mobile related data um, in the infrastructure a lot because other Alternatives are, are, are less available. Um, so I think, in some ways, perhaps the innovation that needs to happen here um, may actually come from the poorest or the most needy countries first, um, rather than from Europe or, or North America or, or Australia.
Thank you. Thank you for those 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 different um, uh, viewpoints, um, including one from uh, a country that you you're very close to. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, and this is a really quickie to to everybody. Um, and I'll start with Richard. Um, if you can give me one key takeaway uh, from today's webinar about sustainability and funding that you'd like the the audience listening to to take away with them, what what would that be? Well, I, I always like to give uh, as an example what happened after the tsunami in 2004. Yeah? So uh, there was a big impact, and uh, 10 years later, uh, there was a system in place called the Tsunami Alert System that is working now across the ocean coasts everywhere, and that now alerts when there is a tsunami. Yeah? Of course, I'm sure that that hasn't been philanthropical, it hasn't been for free, it has been funded, by whatever organizations, governments, companies, but it is there. Yeah? I think with the huge impact that COVID has now, I think we should take the, the challenge and build something with the mobile industry similarly, so that we can say in 10 years, look, we've suffered COVID, but we build a system. And now if there is an outbreak somewhere in a country within 24 hours, all the countries that are in contact by traveling with this country can take their measures right away and don't have to wait wait uh, months for taking action an inspiring vision yes i agree richard um uh manuel what what would your key takeaway be for, for the audience for this webinar quite quite aligned with richard actually um i think uh, what 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 is stopping us from uh, actually scaling and and, and getting into a sustainable process to build that joint capacity. Uh, it's not about offering a new app or tool to a decision maker that will try to, uh, it's very difficult to, to understand. It's actually to put uh, teams of, on both sides of the equation that really understand what the other side needs that can actually call each other quickly, that they have uh, processes and systems um, uh, to work together. Um, so it's, uh, I would say it's not, it's not about the solution itself. It's about the joint machinery to build solutions. What, uh, what is missing? Um, very aligned with Mohammed. I think we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of progress in there. So I'm, I'm optimistic in that sense. If it wasn't because of the, of the pressing nature of the problems that we're facing. So we're close to, um, uh, getting the, uh, to that vision. Um, but I believe that we need to be faster. And for that, we need to acknowledge, uh, uh, more profoundly how we need to build capacity, not just in our organizations, but jointly as a, as a collective effort within our partners and, and try to make them um, more capable on the things that we currently do in our specific uh, uh, business areas, if you will. So uh, I, will, I will say that that would be my, my point for sustainability. Fantastic. So really effective collaboration. Um, it's very close working. And Mohammed, um, have you got a, a final uh, takeaway that you, you think um, you'd like to add to the pot um, on sustainability and funding from, from today's webinar? It, it's very difficult to add more value after uh, <laughs> Manuel has spoken. Um, I, I would say that we're very close. We are very, very close. Um, if we look at what we've achieved um, in the last 20 years, 20 years ago, we had less than 200 million mobile subscribers around the world. Today we have not far off 5 billion. Um, we've made massive strides and the amount that we have with technology been able to understand and respond to the pandemic crisis has been phenomenal compared to any of the other crises that we've had in the last 50 years. Um, so we're very close and I'm very hopeful that with the history of a regulated and um, very globalized industry, um, already having close relationships with governments around the world. Um, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to break through this time and um, really make this work. Thank you. Um, and thank you to, to all three panelists as well for some, some, some very um, insightful, thoughtful contributions here. Uh, that's pulled on some, some some deep knowledge and some many years of experience. Um, some of them frustrating, and some of them very rewarding. So thank you for for that. I'll I'll hand back to uh, Rob now. 
thanks very much, Hilary. Um, yes, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Um, I've been observing those, and I know that many of them we we covered actually through the panel. Um, there was one specific question I did want to to flag. Um, that was a question regarding um, hearing something around the ethical considerations for using AI for impact. Um, uh, to that question specifically, I would direct you to our um, policy and privacy webinar where we focused on that subject in in quite a high level of detail. Um, but the, the other questions, if there are any that we have remained unanswered, um, we will seek to address those uh, post the session, given that we're, we're overrunning on our time uh, at this point. Um, therefore, um, one, final, one of the final things for me to do, um, I wanted to direct you to the AI for Impact Digital Toolkit, um, which is an online resource that's available to all uh, that was put together by the GSMA's AI for Impact team um, there are a number of core topics addressed in this, uh, one of those being sustainable business models, which is, of course, um, an area of focus that we've that we've looked at today. Um, but also in there, there are other sections that look at some of the the, the former uh, webinar sessions, uh, looking at technical considerations, considering policy and regulation, um, but also going into more areas, looking at, for example, the ecosystem, the players involved, uh, roles and responsibilities, um, as well as having a case study portfolio there, which is an opportunity for you to seek out um, more examples and the impacts that, that have been realized from those. Uh, finally, then, uh, is the uh, AI for Impact webinar series. Um, over the coming months, we will as the AI for, I Impact, AI for Impact team continue to publish blogs and webinars on the topic using mobile big data analytics to combat challenges, including COVID-19. Um, so we're building on the foundation series already done, which were outlined earlier for you on policy and privacy and technical delivery and adoption, as well as today's funding and sustainability session. Um, with contributions uh, to uh, further sessions from relevant experts, we'll be uh, looking to provide you with a, a platform for a deeper level of understanding for both operators and governments who wish to develop impacts for mobile big data analytics capabilities. Um, if you wish to register your interest in attending further sessions in the series, uh, you can email us on the uh, email address you see on the screen, um, but you can also visit the gsma.com forward slash better future forward slash AI for impact page, um, which also contains links to the current series of blogs and webinars, but also where future sessions will be posted. Um, therefore, to wrap up today's session, um, I would like to thank our audience for joining us, um, for submitting the questions. Uh, we hope you have found this to be an informative and engaging session. Um, and of course, many thanks also to our presenters and panelists. Um, my colleague Hilary Kemp uh, from the AI Initiative here at the GSMA, uh, Dr. Richard Benjamins from Telefonica, Mohamed Chowdhury from PwC, and last but not least, uh, Manuel garcia Haranth from UNICEF. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join us and share some of your wealth of knowledge and experience uh, in this area with us today. And finally then, from myself, uh, Rob Childs, uh, wishing you all a good day and thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye.